All right. Good morning, everybody. It's Firearms Friday. We've got a we've got a couple of stories to cover, and we're going to talk about the relationship between them, given the current zeitgeist. And uh, special treat for you guys. Cameron is joining us, and here he is. Morning, sunshine. How you holding up? I'm I'm holding. I uh, I found time to watch the first episode of Fallout last night. Was it as disappointing as I expected to be? No. And I thought it was going to be disappointing for the same reasons you did. Be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So we have a we have a female lead and we've got to make sure that we show all the the representation and diversification in the trailer. <laughs> but uh, but the uh, the first episode actually wasn't bad. I don't know if the I don't know if the series is going to be good, but the first episode actually kind of managed to nail the the super dark humor. Like it pulled no punches, but it was kind of funny, and you felt like you were going to go to hell when you died for laughing at it. So. <laughs> I'm I'm going to check it out because I'm a big fan of the franchise. But the uh, the first review I've heard so far, Tim Pool said he watched it with his girlfriend, and he was a big fan fan of the franchise. Um. And his complaint was that because she is not familiar with the franchise, he had to pause often to explain because it, apparently the uh, the showrunners, the writers, just operate under the assumption that the only people that are going to watch the show have played all of the video games for a thousand hours or more apiece. Which, hey, in all fairness, that is the target demo, right? <laughs> like, like one of the problems with all the with all the Kathleen Kennedy Star Wars stuff is she went into the production and she began with the premise. Okay, listen, we hate the fans and we want to get rid of them. Yeah. So the force is female. No, no, it's not. It's Yoda not. was very explicit. It really in this. Isn't. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite literally gender neutral. It's the thing you swear you want. You liberal moron. Anyhow, we're not, we're, we're not talking geek stuff today. Are we? we could, no, we I'd are not. To. We we are well. We're gonna geek out a little bit as far as getting. Uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna get a little wonkish on predictions related to the stories that we have on hand. So, uh, you you really wanted to cover this one, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to kind of take the lead on it. Uh, for the first story, we're gonna start with the Crumblies, and let me switch over to this now. I have three articles pulled up. One is this one, obviously, from C. I've got two, two from CNN and one from the New York Post. So the first one from CNN talks about the actual sentencing. The second one from CNN talks about it, this headline, James and Jennifer Crumbly were found guilty, but they took different paths to get there. And this is, this is going to be part of the tie-in with the Dexter Reed story, which we'll, we'll get into in just a minute. But Cameron, I want you to kind of open us up on the uh, sentencing of James and Jennifer Crumbly. Okay, so Ethan Crumbly was a school shooter, um, uh, was arrested and charged as an adult. Uh, multiple people died. Absolutely terrible situation. And, um, you know, it it is one of those terrible sad things his parents jennifer and jason crumbly were convicted of involuntary manslaughter earlier this week um, and they were convicted of involuntary manslaughter under a michigan law that uh, i don't have in front of me so uh, please excuse me if i if i get some of the tiny details wrong but the michigan law states that if a child uh commits a crime on school property and or with a gun the parents can actually be held criminally liable for what the uh what the child did there's actually been one conviction previously under this law i went i tried to go down the rabbit hole on this um there's actually been one conviction previously under this law where um <laughs> where a kid committed suicide and the parent was still found criminally liable, which is just, that's dark. Um, specifically uh, with Ethan, uh, 
the parents got him this pistol as a Christmas present. Um, and then, um, you know, took him to the range. Uh, the kid appeared to rather obviously have some mental problems. The day of the shooting, he actually drew a picture of a of a school shooting with a caption at the bottom of it that said, you know, uh, the voices won't stop. Please help me. Um, the the teacher at the school that saw the drawing sent him to the principal's office, obviously deeply concerned. The Crumblies were called. They came down to the school, at least as far as I could tell, the mom did. Um, and uh, and the resolution that was kind of agreed to on everybody was like, OK, Ethan could go back to class. And uh, but he has to have a psyche valve in the next 48 hours. Well, that psyche valve never happened because on the way back to class, uh, Ethan pulled the pistol out of his backpack and uh, shot multiple people and some of them died. And now here we are many, many months later and uh, the Crumblies who are, are going to be in prison uh, for at least another eight years, I would suspect. Um, so real quick, you mentioned that he went back, he was sent back to class afterwards. And I want to point out this, this is not an isolated incident. We have, we have several problems that we're going to have to address and discuss on the show this morning. Uh, not, and among them is like in this case, uh, Ethan was just sent back to class after that meeting. Now, Steven Crowder has had a bunch of undercover guys doing Journal, actual journalism, investigative journalism, and there are a few stories that he has covered recently that are related where there, the shooting didn't happen, but multiple instances where a, a student was identified who had written a manifesto and upon investigation had taken steps to acquire material to conduct an attack. And the, the school, the school found the manifesto, the school knew about it. The parents of the, of the students knew about the manifesto. The police were informed about the manifesto and the student was simply sent back to class. In one of them, there's a, there's a young lady who <laughs> was expected to go back to class after, even after the manifesto was discovered, she was not the author of the manifesto, no. The man in in that case, and I'm I'm not I'm not naming the the schools in in this case uh, in this conversation because I don't want to get into the schools in uh, in particular. Y'all should go watch Crowder's reporting on that. But there's one young lady who whose name appeared in the manifesto because the manifesto included an explicit hit list of named targets, and she was on that hit list, and. They just sent the kid back to the same school. Now, this is only tangentially related uh, to the to the rot and corruption that is the public school system generally. You can look at the uh, was it it was Virginia. There was there was the case where the the young the young transgender boy raped a girl at one of the schools and instead of incarcerating him they transferred him to another school where he did it again and he still is not serving time uh so one thing that needs to be very clear in the case of ethan crumbly is that the school has failed miserably in their responsibility and is uh, frankly and Cameron I, I'm sure you'll get into this a little more I would argue that the school in this case is is far more liable far more immediately liable for the uh circumstances leading up to the shooting um yeah okay well you you teed that up um so one thing that's worth noting is um, we know the school had um, a resource officer assigned to it. 
Um, and we know that because it's the resource officer that arrested Ethan Crumbly at the end of his rampage, which meant the school had a resource officer. Um, why didn't that cop pat him down and check his backpack? Because that's what a resource officer is. A resource officer is a uniformed police officer. And no matter how you right. might feel about cops and police power, this, that, that's a cop that has police power that could act like a cop. And uh, no, didn't didn't search Ethan. And um, so there's that. Um, let me back all the way up and be clear. I, I thought about this a lot you know, what side to come down on it on. And I, and I have decided that this is, uh, this is a terrible precedent to, to be set, but I am going to support that argument, <laughs> but moving past that. Um, okay, fine. If the, if the parents are liable, um, why is the school not liable? Well, okay, because the law doesn't say the school is liable. The law says the parents are liable. Okay. And that's that's fair enough. That's a good answer because because it's what the law says. But it's only a good answer in the most strictly technical sense. Yes. And then and then even and I've said before, I'll say again, I hate legalese. I hate getting into the specifics of law. I, I think it is a, an entire business that is conducted. Um, there's a certain amount of, uh, what, what would you call it? Uh, there's a whole lot of extra flowery language that's included in law in order to make it obtuse so that you have no choice but to use the legal system itself in order to navigate the legal system. All that being said, but well, they, they charged Ethan the, as legal an documents, adult. Legal documents are written in legalese by lawyers who are trained to write and understand the legalese in particular there's, there's two reasons for it the one primary reason for it is specificity and clarity in theory so that there theory. can be no confusion within the context of the contract or the the legislation what whatever the document is um and in fairness if you are adept at understanding and reading legalese they are very clear however the other side of that is but they are written in such a way as to be clear within the context of a particular professional jargon in order to exclude the understanding of the document by the layman as a mechanism to secure professional uh professional job security going forward and to create a bar to entry for the layman to understand the documents with which they are presented well, here's why I bring up the interpretation of law, because to me, as a layman, as somebody who who really detests dealing with legalese, I'd literally rather read instructions for how to put a bunk bed together from Ikea. Um, but they charged Ethan as an adult. So Ethan is adult enough to go to prison for the rest of his life for Michigan's version of malice murder. He's adult enough for that, but he's still enough of a minor for his parents to also go to prison for 10 years for involuntary manslaughter. And that, that seems like a, that seems like a contradiction to me. Right. Alex says if a parent breaks I, their I'm kid- I'm gonna get there. Why I, should I'm they actually, be held liable? Manslaughter is a bit much, but there's certainly liability there. And as Cameron just pointed out, Ethan was charged as an adult. So here's the real problem. Since Ethan was charged as an adult, and then his parents were charged with liability for the neglect of their child, I, I have this question for you, Alex. Let's take a case, any case, where you have a, a murderer who is convicted of committing the crime of murder and say he's 18 or... 25 or 40 are we now allowed are, are we now arguing that charles manson's father 
should have been incarcerated when Charles Manson was convicted for the several murders that he was guilty of? See, that's a big problem. Pitt Danny asks, what's his age? Uh, he was 15 at the time that he committed the, the crime, I believe. Um, yeah, he was 15. That's what he said in his manifesto. And so to be clear, this... This is a kid that left a manifesto in which he said, I want to kill X number of people. I want to kill these particular types of people. Um, I I haven't read the manifesto. I've only seen the, the, the excerpts that have been published, which have been published on places like CNN, and they don't mention any particular political leaning, which tells me that there likely is a particular political leaning, and it is the left. Because if he if he said I want to, he was a magatard. If he yeah, was a mag a mag a maga supporter, then it, we'd have the full manifesto released, obviously. But one thing that caught my attention in the manifesto that from the the excerpts that we've seen is he explicitly said, "I will do this, I will do that, and then I will surrender, and confess, and accept life in prison." Uh, he he knew essentially that he was at no personal risk. There was no danger to himself. He he never believed that he was ever at risk of suffering any harm, other than surrendering his freedom to prison. Oh, uh, so look, let me let me because I'm I knew this would this would come up as part of this discussion. So let me just steal man the the position like this uh apparently the pistol was not locked up and it was known that this kid had mental problems um so if i if i get drunk and uh go driving and kill somebody i could be charged with vehicular homicide i know these are not strict one-to-one -one, analogies here but we do legally have a whole set of laws on the books that allow you to be charged in the death of another human being that's in fact why we have manslaughter charges and even ethically as a society um we do accept that if your actions cause the death of another human being you can be held liable for that and so um I don't think you can argue that the parents acted intelligently. I think you can argue that they acted stupidly. So Agreed. what would you so so what would you say in the face yeah, look, of the of the steel man? Let me let me clarify something real quick for and this is for Alex too. Um my position here is not that the parents are without blame. That's that's not what I'm getting at. But here's what I want you to I want you to understand and take away from this very clearly. These parents, they were found guilty before the trial ever began. They the courts and the juries decided that these parents were guilty of manslaughter before they ever began the trial. Let me support that argument with the evidence uh, from from this art from the CNN article. Both James and Jennifer Crumbly were found guilty, but they took different paths to get there. Oh, they they argued they argued two very very different routes. Uh, on the one hand, for the mother, they made the arguments that oh well she's she's a bad person because she had an affair, so she's morally corrupt. And hey, I'll agree with that. Your your infidelity, I I agree that that equals moral corruption that is likely to affect your children, and you're you're trash. You are trash for that. Um, but then they they looked at his dad and they went after, oh, well, he was he was involved in gun culture. He liked guns. He purchased the firearm. They took very, two very different routes to get there on the evidence um, and are are making the argument that even though even though for the purposes of this crime, Ethan is being charged as an adult, which legally, requires that you be found to have the mental capacity to make the adult decision to have to have made an informed choice which carries criminal culpability 
right? So this, so Alex, this is not a straw man. The if if the child, if if the young man is an adult in the eyes of the law, then charging a 16-year-old parent who has been charged as an adult with culpability for his crimes is not legally distinct from charging any other adult's parents for culpability in their crimes. Now, a fact that cannot be ignored in this case is that this is a white family. There's a reason I bring that up. Well, Let's take well, a moment. I, I just I just wanted to, to put a button on it real quick with, and I and I know you want to transition over to the other story, but um, one, I think this is a case of where the minority it has made the majority look terrible. The vast majority of people that are in gun culture would never give a lunatic a gun. Like I wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that. Nobody in our chat would do that. The, the, the vast, vast, vast majority of people that believe in the second amendment, like myself that want to see the NFA repealed. Um, like we don't need the NFA to know who should have a gun and who shouldn't like, like we already know this, there is no gun show loophole. You stupid shits. Stop it. Um, but the other thing, and you mentioned they're a white family, but I, I, it's not just that they're white. They're relatively unattractive people that don't conduct themselves very well, that have both got a checkered past. If there was a case that you wanted to take and you wanted to jam something like this through, the Crumblies served it up on a silver platter. Like, they, they ran from their arraignment. They, they took $4,000 out of the bank and went and hid in a warehouse. Oh yeah, don't don't get me wrong. These guys, these guys are trash. They fucked up. <laughs> they they could hardly be more wrong in how they handled themselves. But you know, back to Alex. Alex is one hundred percent right to say that at at the barest minimum, no reasonable person can say other than manslaughter is a stretch. So it's uh, now in fairness, in fairness, given, given that and giving it over to Alex, that manslaughter is a stretch and that I agree with you a hundred percent on that in fairness. I don't know what, what would be the, the reasonable charge. Um, and Alex is saying the age is irrelevant, but no, the age is not irrelevant because of the fact that the child was charged as an adult instead of a minor. The age is absolutely relevant. Um, well, since the law in Michigan specifically states that if it's a minor who commits a gun crime um, on or near a school, like the law itself very, very, very narrowly targets this. Like if I wanted to go into full-blown tinfoil hat Alex Jones territory here, you'd write a law like this and then... Uh, and then try and get some false flag attack to happen so that you could enforce the law. And now you have the precedent on the books. I'm not going that far. Well, let me go. Let me go kind of that almost that far. This, this is a little different. Uh, and, and this is where we get back to something that we've talked about before. And I get to talk about Tim pool a little bit here, because like I've said many times in the past, the slow red pilling of Tim pool has been a privilege to watch. So let me show you the story of Dexter Reed. And you'll note, this is not this is a web search, right? I'm just showing you a DuckDuckGo search because here's what I want you to see. Dexter Reed killing. Body camera footage shows 96 shots fired. Dexter Reed shooting in Chicago. What you need to know. Dexter Reed, Chicago police fired nearly 100 shots during fatal traffic stop, right? I just searched the name Dexter Reed. 11th Precinct call... Uh, district council, uh, 11th police district council calls for restraint in community. Dexter Reed shooting leaves Chicago with questions that demand answers. Head of Chicago police oversight wants officers in Dexter Reed shooting strip. Cameron, you asked in the chat earlier when I mentioned I was going to discuss this story on the program this morning. What do you know about the Dexter Reed shooting? I know I've seen his mama on social media going, they killed my baby. 
are are you do you understand that the this incident or and because certainly you can ex, cannot extrapolate this data this information from the data that i've just shown you um you understand of course that dexter reed fired 11 shots at the police uh, yeah, hitting yeah, yeah one yeah. of them before the officers opened fire yeah yeah if this had gone differently uh dexter reed would be charged with aggravated assault and attempted murder yeah that's that's yeah yeah this was a so, this was a justified shooting that that was clean shoot all day yeah but you wouldn't know that from looking at the google search would right you? this was a clean shoot all day now i i will also i'll grant that 96 shots okay there were several police officers around the vehicle and like xander that's a, that's a great that's a great comment there uh because i i don't know about you cameron but i've shot people in vehicles before and it's tricky because <laughs> it's not just about your marksmanship it's about stuff moving around and getting in the way um it's no it's uh, it's tricky shooting people in a vehicle I, I have never shot anybody there's, in a car. There's so. there's a reason there's a reason we use a belt fed machine gun when that comes up if possible. No uh, uh, clarification that that was in an active war zone color of law within the within the context of uh, of Barack Obama's uh, rules of engagement. It, it it was a cool shoot. I mean clean. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway. Anyway. But what I'm getting at. Why is it Dexter Reed's mother being charged for the shot that hit the police officer? Well, the technical answer is because she lives in Illinois and not Michigan. But the correct answer is this. They're black. It really is that simple. Um, we look at the story of Daniel Penny, who attempted to protect people being attacked by a repeat violent offender with known mental illness and the end result was that the violent criminal died at the hands of a u.s marine and the marine turned himself in when when asked went quietly but yeah, now we've got this, but but now we've got this uh we've got george floyd 2.0 here in dexter reed where we have these headlines where they are clearly and very carefully attempting to use Russell conjugation to craft a narrative with the hope that they can reproduce the, the summer of love riots of 2020. And we can go back to the Ahmaud Arbery case when you and I first discussed it on the show. And I pointed out, look, here's what's happening in the Ahmaud Arbery case. It's a clear cut case of self-defense in an instance where a citizen's arrest went sideways. That has been the determination of more than one prosecutor, but each of those prosecutors has been harassed and intimidated by BLM. So the terrorist organization has threatened the prosecutors until, until they recused themselves. And they did, they just lather, rinsed, repeated that cycle until they found a prosecutor that said, you know what? I'll hang up white boy. I'm down. Let me do that. And then it even went so far in that case as the judge listened to the defense give their defense and then said, you're not allowed to use that defense. Now, th this is super dirty. If you understand how these, how these cases work, the judge was informed beforehand what the defense would be. And then he waited for them to present that defense to the jury and then nullified the defense, which in effect takes what has now become an admission of guilt and but it wasn't an admission of guilt it was a description of the situation taking into account the relevant law and then the judge decided essentially to repeal the law you know just on a on an ex post factum basis just you know what i've just decided that that law doesn't matter anymore for the purposes of this case so the judge went out of his way to set them up right so what so you take you take that case you take george floyd you take this dexter reed story uh the the thing that's going on with james and jennifer crumbly the uh remember the the couple with the pictures of, of bad marksmanship discipline 
on the front yard. I don't remember their yeah, names. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know what I'm talking about. And and they were like they were clearly in the right. You got you got a bunch of you got a bunch of terrorists ripping down your gated community gate and throwing bricks through windows and waving and firing guns around. And you walk out in the yard with your firearm and say, not in my neighborhood, not in my yard. And, oh, well, they go to jail. Okay, no. What's happening here is the police are being trained by the media and the legal system to believe that there is no good outcome when they attempt to enforce the law where criminals are involved and that decent law-abiding, most especially white people, will not resist when faced with even the most obviously unconstitutional of consequences. You take, you go back and you look at the case where uh, the cases in uh, during the summer of love, there were several instances where uh, Proud Boys and Antifa clashed. And what would happen is the Antifa would be in black block with face masks on and they would run. And the, the Proud Boys would turn around and say, hey, yo, officer, we surrendered because this was a this was obviously self-defense. We were protesting. They attacked us and we defended ourselves and the officers arrest the Proud Boys and they get sentenced for assault, battery and, and all kind of other things. Even even in the face of video evidence that clearly showed that the uh, the the black bloc terrorists were the aggressors and the Proud Boys were just engaged in self-defense. It's it's not just the narrative of us versus them, et cetera, et cetera. The police are being trained through this propaganda to target a particular demographic. Um, I and when we I, first covered when we first covered Ahmad Arbery, and and we talked about the terroristic threats against the the uh, prosecutors in that case. I made the wild claim, which at the time I thought was a wild and exaggerated claim, that the objective is to essentially create a world where if you are a minority, you are allowed to commit crimes. Since then, we've seen cases like this Dexter Reed thing where the, the press is going full full out to try and defend him. We've seen the January 6th, 6th shooter where it was actively defended in the press and the uh, the manifesto was suppressed. Um, it, it, has been, it has been the case in the last several school shootings that have occurred that there was some sort of uh, sexual degeneracy or confusion involved in the, in the shooter's particular mental illness that led up to it. And that, that information has been radically suppressed uh, through, throughout that cycle. Um, and there are many other cases and instances where it's very clear that if you are demographically or politically correct, you are essentially immune from the service of justice in the commission of crimes. And the result has been Dexter Reed is, gets cover, uh, the, the flash mobs robbing robbing luxury stores, robbing uh, malls, just looting and pillaging. And there's there's no there there's no redress for that grievance. You know <clears throat> Papa Sheepdog by my dad. Um part of the reason why he retired uh when he did and the way that he did is he was concerned about this exact thing. And um, my father uh, was actually a very compassionate police officer. Um, Alex, Alex said one time on his show, I, I, I can't quote it exactly, but it's something that stuck with me. That there's no such thing as a cop that is not corrupt. Um, and the the trust and the power that we vest in police officers makes that essentially true. If a if a cop pulls you over for speeding and you're polite and he doesn't write you a ticket, that's technically a minor form of corruption. 
Like that's yeah, that's that's you but can, no, you can, no, well, legally they have discretion. Yes, however, as soon as you give a cop discretion, there's no way that I mean that the discretion is a double edged sword, cuts both ways. Um, and my my father, being a compassionate police officer, understood that if you were dealing with the cops, you were probably in one of the worst moments of your life didn't matter if you were the victim or even the perpetrator now now you're dealing with the cops like you know it, you, it's never hey i'm having a great birthday party officer and i want you to just come inside and have a piece of cake just because no it's because oh <laughs> officer i'm having a birthday party and uh uncle jimmy and aunt jane had too much to drink and they got in a fist fight in the backyard like that's uh that's usually why the cops are there um and so despite the fact that he actually was willing to cut people a lot of slack, you know, he, he had a real problem with the way cops will, they will overcharge you anything and everything they can charge you with on the scene. They'll throw at you. And then uh, you sort all that out in court. Like he, he had a real problem with that, even though he understood the logic of that practice. Um, and he understood that there was not going to be a place in the world for him. That having a man of his level of ethics, recognizing the awesome amount of power and responsibility that he had, um, was, was going to get tossed out in favor of the things that you are describing here and now. Specifically with regard to the Dexter Reed situation, first of all, 96 shots is nothing, okay? If your gun has 12 bullets, well, okay, you just need like eight cops to do a mag dump. And Bob's your uncle. You're at 96 shots. And, yeah, and, let, me and, and let me tell you, if you, if you are, if one of your battle buddies get shot right in front of you you're doing a mag dump hey, you, like well if your battle buddy got shot right in front of you and the you know, dexter fired through his car window from inside of his car if if your target if your if your enemy if the person attempting to murder you with a firearm is dug into what what amounts to a bunker is in an armored fortified position mag dump is your tactically correct solution period with you know un unless you have ordnance available unless you've got a light anti-tank weapon or a claymore or a hand grenade available mag dump is your solution uh, you know or, or belt dump um i don't think the dexter reed situation is going to gain traction uh as another george floyd flashpoint for a couple of reasons uh the george floyd video was hard for everybody to watch um oh, yeah, for one because they picked the hard part and cut it out and gave and got rid of everything else dude it was almost a year after the george floyd incident before we all knew conclusively from the the video evidence being released but what happened is Floyd forced his way through the vehicle, shoved the officer out of the way, demanding to be taken out of the vehicle and placed on the ground before he was placed on the ground where he ended up dying. Well, there's the there's the there's the lack of video that's going to tug at the heartstrings and um he shot a cop. <laughs> Most Dexter of us Reed shot a cop, not George Floyd. That's correct. <laughs> no, no. George Floyd just threatened to shoot a pregnant woman. That was a totally different right. thing. Um, and and that's and and this is important too. Dexter Reed didn't just shoot at cops. He, he hit shot one. Shot a cop. We've yes. and we've seen the body camera footage from several angles now. It is unquestionably clear that Dexter Reed opened fire first, and the other officers did not return fire until just a moment after the officer who was hit was hit and went down the officer that was shot hit the ground before the first cop opened fire and then they all opened up which i mean 
correct response. Like like said at the beginning, like clean shoot is clean. Um, but I don't I don't think this one is going to stick. Um, in fact, I knew, and this is maybe this is cynical, uh, but it was accurate. I didn't know much about the Dexter Reed situation, but the first time I saw his mom in front of the news cameras weeping over how they killed my baby, I, I knew that her baby was engaged in a criminal act when he got killed. Did Literally, didn't even need to look it up. I already knew that. And then, surprise, surprise, I looked it up, and it's like, oh, yeah, here's the other side of the story. He shot a cop. Oh, well. You know, that makes things slightly different, okay? If he if he had 96 rounds fired into his vehicle over a bag of weed, okay, maybe we're talking about something here. But no, he shot a cop. So, yeah, and let's, while you know, I understand for, the, for the point sake that of you're argument, making. Real quick, for, he shot a cop. For the sake of argument, let's, real quick, just for the sake of argument, let's, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's assume that, all police are so corrupt that the morally correct thing for all human beings to do is to take up arms and engage in combat with the police. Just for the sake of argument. And I want to point something out. No matter what the level of corruption is, from a strictly tactical position, the fact of the matter is that the police are armed and armored. And if you choose to open fire on that entity... You are choosing to assume the risk that comes with engaging in mutual combat. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Uh, to be clear, I am not making the claim that we need to open, that we need to take up arms against the police. I'm, I'm making the point that if it were the case, that that were the moral and reasonable thing to do, and there were even a good lawful argument for it that you could make in the court, the fact remains but you are making a particular choice to engage in a tactical decision which has specific and clearly predictable outcomes. And that is the choice that Dexter Reed made when he opened fire on these officers. Yeah, violate the NAP at your own peril. Yeah. Like that's... And, and you and I have talked about this before. It's not that there are not times where... You know, that violence never solves anything. Well, except for all the times violence did actually sort of solve the problem. Uh, so, but anytime, even if it is justified violence, if you engage in violence, like, boy, that's a sword that cuts both ways. If I right. pick a fight with you and you knock out two of my teeth, well, yeah, you are the one who knocked out my teeth, but I am the one who picked the fight with you. You just like gave me is... an idea for a show. We should do a show entitled No, No, I'll have to work on the title, but something to the effect of No Problem Which Has Not Been Solved by Violence Was a Legitimate Problem. <laughs> That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we or, ought to. Or it wasn't a serious problem. You know, we ought to we ought to pull out that that line of dialogue from Torg in Borderlands where he says, "Violence never solves anything except for all the things it does." <laughs> like that was I love Torg. <laughs> <laughs> Who was so I was. Uh, out last night with a shark wearing a bolo tie and you ask yourself who was wearing the bolo tie me or the shark answer yes yes <laughs> <laughs> but look part of what I, I don't want just to get get lost in us cutting up the optics here while i don't think that the the reed situation is going to go as far as george floyd because he shot a cop the optics are important. The crumblies look a certain way and were treated that way. And Dexter Reed's mom looks a certain way and is getting treated completely different. Um, yeah, lock her up. <laughs> well, here's the thing, though. Um, I, I think that this is this is a slippery slope and i heard somebody say recently that the slippery slope isn't slippery if you refuse to slip and 
Uh, okay, fair enough. If that is true. Um, you know, in uh, in the Dark Knight, like Batman literally violates the civil liberties of the entire city to catch the Joker. Like, please believe that movie is about terrorism. Like, it's about Batman and the Joker, but it's actually about combating terrorism. It's, um, it's it's very much about the Patriot Act. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, part of what happens at the end of the movie is Batman takes all the blame for everybody's crimes, but destroys his ability to spy on the entire city. So, like, okay, fine. Batman was the uh, the philosopher king who had the highest level of morality, but. That's not what tends to happen in reality. In reality, we deal with a, a, a perpetual stream of Saul Alinsky inspired tiny little shifts to the Overton window. And um, something like this, where parents are charged with manslaughter, like in the state of Georgia, we've actually got a whole lot of laws if you wish to avail yourself to them where you can come back from almost any crime. There are a few that you can't come back from, but you can come back from almost any crime. And on the other side of it, it might be 10, 20 years later, but you can actually have everything come off your record and no longer be a convicted felon. And there's a lot of states that have got programs like that in place. Manslaughter is one of those things you cannot come back from. So to charge somebody with manslaughter essentially ruins their life. Even if they're not convicted of it, you, you don't think it's ever, that's one of those things that the Google search engine is never going to forget. Like I'm going to type your name in and I'm going to see that you were charged with manslaughter. So why is this a, a slippery slope? It's not just a slippery slope in the, legal sense it's a slippery slope in the sense of for better or worse we live in an online world where your facebook and your x and your TikTok and all that drive the narrative they are they are part of and a driver of the zeitgeist so um to even get accused of something like this is is terrible for you it it has the potential to really just ruin your life and then when you factor in all the stuff like with uh, hunter biden's laptop where basically everybody put their thumb on the scale and said you know actually this laptop might be real and we know this laptop might be real but we're gonna tell everybody that it's not and we're actually going to threaten and harass uh any news organization or social media platform that runs with the story so you know what blew my mind was that the fbi had the laptop for a year before the new york post article yeah well i mean that's and uh, i mean we've seen what's on the laptop it's full of evidence of crimes and essentially at the very least of, hookers and blow yeah <laughs> and and some of those hookers are very clearly underage. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, and it's, I want to address something real quick. Anarchy asks: Do cops have more of a right to self defense and life than the average person? Xander says no, and then and then adds: They're granted more leeway in general, but they have no additional right. Um, another major factor in in that question, Anarchy, uh. I agree, and it is legally the case, as Xander points out, that no, police officers do not have more of a right to self-defense and life than the average person. However, the fact is that because of the nature of their profession and their daily activities, they have a much higher degree of probability to be engaged in a self-defense type situation than most of us do right they they do in fact have a high contact profession where they're actively looking for situations where self-defense is likely to be a factor um most of us in our day-to-day -day lives we're not out looking for situations where 
we're putting ourselves in additional clear and present danger. I put all that shit behind me. I'm retired. I don't, I don't hunt terrorists anymore. Much as I miss it, I just, it's not the game. Um, Anarchy remi <laughs> reminds us of the uh, the cop that shot at the acorn. Fat. Okay, we covered that on a Firearms Friday episode. I showed that video. That shit was hilarious. <laughs> so, so here here's the thing though. I reject the slippery slope um, fallacy in this sense. I do think it is a legitimate fear of of the slippery slope because. And I want to be I've thought about the best way to phrase this because Chris and I actually gamed this show out um, days ago when the verdict first came down. Um, it's not just that we are opening up this bizarre world where now parents can be charged with criminal liability for the voluntary actions of their children. And, and this is a world where, man, like... 20% of the kids are queer or trans or some some bizarre thing. This is a world where we we locked down society in front of them over a disease that turns out had a 99% survival rate if you did the things that Donald Trump suggested, like get fucking sunshine. Um, so we're going to have kids with all these mental problems and we're going to have parents that are that can be held criminally liable for them currently only in Michigan. But you don't think, uh, you, you don't think other lefty states. Well, that'll absolutely to... pop up in, in, uh, California, New York, Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, but specifically, I mean, if, if you've got a Soros funded DA in your state, then, uh, this is coming for you. And it, but particularly, one of the reasons why I fundamentally reject any and all gun laws and think they're wrong is because a gun law denotes a special thing about a gun. Armed robbery doesn't stop to be an armed robbery <clears throat> if I sneak up behind you and put a knife in your back. It is still armed robbery. However, we tend to treat armed robbery with a gun more harshly than we treat armed robbery with a knife. Even though it is 100% the same crime. And because of that, and <clears throat> because we've had these laws on the books for some time now, we actually have created a um both a social thing where guns are looked at as a thing like and i'm sure we've all encountered this and it's like yeah but do you really need more than six shots like ooh, oh my god yeah have you ever been hog hunting like buddy you <laughs> like the those things man when they charge at you 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 better be prepared to to dump every bullet you've got because i promise those tusks can fuck you up right but do i need more than six shots yeah yeah frankly there might be a guy in a car shooting at police officers i hope i have money to... oh, uh, you think you don't need more than six shots oh 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 my sweet summer child <laughs> right You've clearly never been in a gunfight but we've but we've created <coughs> excuse me but we've created this this sense in society where the gun itself is bad. In fact, <coughs> excuse me, having a gun on you during the commission of a crime is an aggravating factor. You don't actually have to use the gun in the crime. You just have to have the gun on you while you commit the crime. Even if I'm yeah, willing, it, to, even if I'm willing to grant, fine. It doesn't have to be a gun, real gun. Yeah, even if I'm willing to grant, uh, fine, you use the gun, that's an aggravating factor because using a weapon is an aggravating factor. Fine, I'll give you that just for the sake of this argument. Um, just having the gun on you, as Chris points out, it could be an airsoft gun and you can still have all the gun aggravations added to your charges. Well, why? Because the gun is evil? And that brings it all the way back to the Michigan law, 
the Michigan law specifically states if a firearm is used. So basically, if Ethan Crumbly had gotten a couple hundred yards of barbed wire and a few gallons of gasoline and burned his school to the ground and locked children in their classrooms by tying the barbed wire around the locks, his parents wouldn't have been charged. No, it's only because Ethan used a gun. And I would even go so far as to say, well, mental health is is an issue here. Uh, you know, we, we shouldn't give crazy people guns. Should we not give crazy people guns because we shouldn't give crazy people guns? Or should we not give crazy people guns because we've created this expectation that the gun is this magical, mythical, death-dealing machine? That you can play Call of Duty in real life, motherfuckers. And to a sick mind, they say, okay, well, I want that gun. You can, I forget his name, that that crazy guy that uh, ran a truck through a Christmas parade a few years ago. He didn't use a gun. He used a truck. And I promise every single person at that Christmas parade is scarred for life over what happened that day and i'm always i'm i'm always hesitant to have this particular conversation on air because i'm i'm terrified that i'll give somebody an ideas but i i am grateful that the problem we have in theory is mass shooters because a mass shooter somebody going in with a firearm and selecting targets as horrible as you may think that is, and it is horrible. I don't mean to downplay that. We are seeing, we are not seeing these same sort of psychopaths use mass casualty weapons to, to, a, to real effect. And I'm scared to death. Yeah, that it's Timothy McVeigh about we'll that. Have an, yeah, that we'll have an event like that, right? Um, if this, if this, if Ethan hadn't been dedicated to the idea of going in and shooting as many people as he could get away with before the police arrived and then surrendering himself and turning himself in, um, you cannot imagine without having been there, what a suicide bomber is capable of. Yeah. Alex, Alex says in the comments that felony with a firearm enhancement laws. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that is wrong. I think that is fundamentally wrong. It is a, it's a backdoor way of, of having gun control. You don't have to have a gun control law if you make it super more extra dirty bad that you committed a crime while having a firearm. Like, um, I wanted to roll in some mods Torre, but we're, but we're like at an hour here, uh, uh, actually, we're not quite at an hour, so I want to make sure that we actually make the hour on this one. So just because we've gotten that far, I want to go ahead and make sure that we go over one hour uh, for the purposes of the algorithm because we haven't done a full one hour in a while. Um, and, I mean, we're going to make it. We've, we've got 45 seconds to go. Do uh, you want to cover the story Steve dropped in the chat? Have a good old-fashioned DGU? I do, but... I, I had another thought that I wanted to that I wanted to get out and I, I think I just lost my train of thought. Hang on, what was the oh oh the self-defense thing. Okay, yeah. So anarchy mentions if the average person wasn't being criminalized, um wasn't wasn't criminalized by defending themselves from a crazy guy with a gun, we would have less crazy guys with guns. The uh an armed society is a polite society. That's an old adage that is truer than you can possibly imagine without without actually living it um and, and i mentioned the daniel penny story earlier part of what's happening is and this goes back to the press propaganda thing the police are be and i said the police are being trained to view certain people as soft targets and to avoid engaging with anyone else to avoid engaging with minorities uh, most especially minorities, most especially, most especially those hostile foreign invaders. The police are being explicitly trained 
to not stop crime that is committed by likely Democrat voters. And at the same time, like we saw with the Daniel Penny case, Daniel Penny, like we saw with the with the uh, McMichael's case, the Daniel Penny case, um, they are being trained to explicitly demonize, criminalize, and persecute. And yes, I said persecute, not prosecute. Anyone who does not fit the likely leftist voter block demographic narrative for persecution in order the the explicit intent is to scare you out of protecting yourself there's a story from the uh from solzhenitsyn from the gulag archipelago if you haven't read it you should there was uh, one story in there where there was a young soldier who was attacked by someone and in defense of his own life being who while he was being attacked by an armed man used his small folding pocket knife and killed his attacker and he was charged with murder and in his prosecution he was told that what he should have because he asked hey the guy said he was going to kill me he attacked me he tried to kill me and i used what i had to hand to defend myself what should i have done and the answer that the prosecution gave was you should have fleed the scene you should have run away right and we've talked about this when we've especially on firearms friday when we've covered the rapid and gloriously thankful expanse of so-called constitutional carry states but uh until very recent and still in some state like new jersey is still this way um the law is duty to retreat if someone enters your home with a firearm and you kill them with your firearm in self-defense when you find yourself in that courtroom you are going to have to prove that you tried to flee and were pursued by the assailant until there were no more avenues through which you could flee like if they if they broke into your home and in, into your apartment and they came in the front door and you shot them without having first tried to go out the window and down the fire escape they will charge you with a crime that's insane yeah because turning your back on a criminal is a yeah brilliant brilliant move yeah duty duty to retreat is uh evil <laughs> it is evil retreat should only be a necessary tactical maneuver you, you retreat when you need to regroup and and begin a flanking maneuver or when your losses are so insurmountable that you can only hope that in beginning a retreat you can recover some of your men without suffering total casualties retreat is an absolute last option and if you're the only if you're the only engaged fighter in a conflict retreat is not it's not that it's not an option because oh i'm never going to run away no it is tactical suicide like like cameron just said turning your back to an armed assailant is essentially surrendering to shuffle loose the mortal coil you're choosing to die yeah so um <laughs> that's a yes fair enough <laughs> you still got that top comment badge i feel like that wins right there yep yeah, i i do but only when we're doing it through the obs i don't I have that set up in the in the studio setup i i haven't had time to play with this but i'm about to have in, in about three <laughs> weeks here i'm about to have a lot more time to do some stuff with the show oh uh, so none of those changes are going to happen before may but they will be coming up okay we're still we're still live we're way over time but since we're still live let's get one dgu in before we call it a day how about it woman who allegedly woman allegedly ambushed by home intruders shoots one in the head killing him and injures another in philadelphia um, okay <laughs> all right feminists this one's for you 
Pennsylvania police said the woman was able to shoot and kill one home intruder and send another to a hospital after being ambushed at her Philadelphia apartment. Now, being ambushed, that's an interesting, that's an interesting turn of phrase here. The woman arrived at her apartment on the first floor of a row home on Chestnut with her boyfriend at about 2 a.m. on March 29th when three armed men grabbed her, according to the police. The woman shot two of the men during a brief scuffle where 13 shots were fired. One of the alleged intruders, a 32-year-old, was found in a bedroom with a gunshot to the head and numerous shots to the chest. And he was declared dead at the scene. DRT! A second man fled through a back door and sought treatment for gunshot injuries to his shoulder at Mercy Hospital. Ah, he got caught because he wasn't smart enough to go to the vet. <laughs> the intended victim said the home intruders were disguised as police officers. Oh, shit. Before the altercation, and at least one of the three had what was described to be a badge on a chain around his neck. The 31-year-old man who went to the hospital was arrested, but police had no further information on the third alleged intruder who escaped. A neighbor named Aaron Allen told KW, KYW-TV that the woman had moved into the home with her family about a year prior to the incident. She don't bother nobody, said Allen. People so mean, you don't know what people might do, he added, carrying guns, and she probably was trying to defend herself, and I don't blame her. I don't blame her either, Alan. That's another neighbor named Tressie Williams said she had been assaulted in the same area and the recent shooting makes her want to move away even more. That's shocking. It makes no sense, she said. I say to myself, I'm scared to go to work. I'm scared to go home, Wilson added. Now you're scared to be in your own house. They reported that the woman was cooperating with police and it was unclear whether she would face charges over the shooting. If she faces charges over this shooting, that, I mean, that just, uh, she cannot be charged for the shooting. That that just can't, it, it must not happen. Well, I mean, we're talking about Pennsylvania and we're talking yeah. about, we're talking about Philadelphia. So we're talking about uh, a largely blue state in a definitely blue city. He Full of corn pops. <laughs> but look, pal. Look, pal. I just, just my corn pop is bad, dude. He's a bad dude. But I, I, but you, but you beat the chain on the ground and you get your razor blades all rusty and, uh, yeah, yeah. The elder abuse in the White House continues. Um, so this woman's a badass. No right? shit. Like to get ambushed, and. I'm going to make a lot of assumptions about these guys. There was three of them. They grabbed her. They had enough foresight to disguise themselves as cops. This was not a junkie desperate for a fix. No, this was planned and organized. That's right. This was not a, this, this, this was about the maximum level of danger you could encounter. And they got the drop on her, and she still managed to fight back and tag two of the three, one of them fatally. That's uh, that's pretty darn impressive. And also, just for the funsies of it, man, could you imagine how the boyfriend feels? <laughs> yeah. <that's... laughs> he has been somewhat emasculated here. <laughs> now look, now look. Don't get me wrong. If uh, if my girlfriend is armed and some shit goes down and she's able to fight back and I'm not, by all means, babe, fight back. Oh Please yeah, do. But damn. Yeah, damn. Well, I mean, my my wife and I have discussed this on on many occasions. Um, I if if the shit hits the fan, I am the primary. But that doesn't mean you wait for me to start the show. <laughs> yeah yeah if you've got a shot take the shot but please it's okay um now i actually uh, I, I almost hate that we read this story because there's a lot to talk about here um the assailants were dressed as police that means that somewhere in this confrontation this woman had to make the de the decision either 
she had to believe that I'm dealing with corrupt police who are about to wrap me up into a corrupt system where I am likely to have my life ruined despite having done no wrong. And that is a risk greater than the risk of engaging these officers with my firearm and escaping and living on the lamb and going and hiding in the woods or something like that. Or she had to come to the conclusion, she had to determine in the face of contradicting evidence that these are not actually police officers and what's happening here is I'm being assailed by people who are impersonating the police. That is a that is an incredibly difficult position to be in. Um, like there there have been cases where people shot real police officers, and it was it was found to be self defense because the police officer was acting so extraordinarily outside the scope of their authority, and in conjunction with acting so far outside of the scope of the authority, were endangering the life, limb, property, safety, liberty, etc. of the of the victim. But essentially, you have to prove that the cop was was originally a cop and had essentially surrendered his police status by choosing to become a criminal without removing his uniform in order to prove a case of self-defense where there's a, where the assailant is a police officer. So she had to do some quick, some quick head math to choose to essentially, right. We, we know from the story following the investigation that these were not police officers, but that they were dressed as police officers. So somewhere in there, she had to make the choice. I am shooting a cop in the head. That's a choice that she was forced to make in, in those circumstances. And it, you know, I, we don't know, and we may never know if she believed this is actually a police officer, but he's acting so far outside of the law that I should, that I feel justified in defending myself with deadly force, or this is someone impersonating a police officer. Right now I'm assuming I'm assuming that if they went so far as to disguise themselves as police officers, that they weren't wearing just like cheap uh, costumes from, you know, like like a, a Halloween costume, right? It's illegal to impersonate a police officer. It is not illegal to wear a costume that makes you appear to be a police officer. You haven't actually committed a crime until you are in some way making the claim to have the legitimacy of that authority. That said, that would be a very difficult position to be in because she had to either believe that she was shooting a cop and was justified in doing so, or that this person was not a cop. And I don't know what factors were there for her mind to process that information. Yeah, either way. Um... She's somebody I'd be okay with covering my six. Yeah, I, I no think doubt. she could handle it. Like there's, uh, there's no doubt there. Yeah. So, All right. Um, well, the, the 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 smadge has a request. <laughs> He's just tired of watching me gum. <laughs> so let's uh let's go ahead and get to the safety brief. It is Friday. We are going into the weekend. This weekend, uh. Is there, is there anything special going on this weekend that I need to know about Cameron? No. I it's mean, just the weekend. maybe. So we're going on the weekend. So thanks for watching the show today, guys. Here's your safety brief. Don't drive drink. Don't fry bacon naked. And don't shoot at cops unless you're real sure they're not. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Keep calm and carry one. We love you. And at least I will see you on Monday. All right. You take care, brother. We'll see you next time. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. Everything went wrong. It was supposed to do this.